Hello everyone and welcome back to the Bibliotech. My name is Vervain and today I'm here to tell you about our latest acquisition which is Battle Ready by Oli Ollerton. We have the hard copy version of this book published in 2020 by Blink Publications. However, there are also ebook and audiobook versions of this title available. I will leave links in the description section if you would like to purchase your own copy. So this book is interesting in that it's partially autobiography and partially self-help, so I'm not actually sure how we should catalogue it here on our shelves. So in this video, I'm going to start by giving you a quick overview of how I came to hear about the author. I'm then going to talk about the contents of the book so you know what's going on and you can decide for yourself if it's a title you would like to read. And I'm then going to finish off with some of my commentary on some of the themes that come up in this title. I've had some spare time on my hands recently, so I started watching the TV show Celebrity SAS Who Dares Wins. This is a British reality TV show which takes some British celebrities and puts them through the selection process of the Special Air Service, or the SAS, which is an elite branch of the UK Army. The hosts of this show are all former SAS personnel, including Ollie Ollerton, and so that's basically how I um, found out about the author. And then I found out that he had this book out and I thought, okay, why not? It sounds interesting. It's about um, setting goals, overcoming procrastination. Sounds interesting. Why not give it a go? So that's how I came to hear of the author and about this book. Battle already starts after Ollerton has left the SAS. He talks about how being in the SAS gave him a sense of purpose, but once he returned to civilian life, he felt lost and he had a number of dead-end jobs, um, didn't feel that he had a life purpose or that he was you know, fulfilling his life purpose. And he also talks about being in a number of failed relationships. So each chapter in the book talks about a personal experience after he left the SAS. And then each chapter talks about an epiphany he had or an activity that he did to turn his life around and to find meaningful work and what led to him creating his company called Breakpoint, which is also the name of the title. So as I mentioned, this book is half autobiography, half self-help book. It's written, it reminds me kind of like a school textbook. So each chapter is about a concept. So let's say, you know, discipline, epiphany, you know, interpersonal relationships. So Ollerton says, okay, here's the concept. Here's my personal experience, so here's how we apply the concept or the idea in a real-world scenario. And then each chapter ends with an activity based on that concept. So like in a textbook, there's always a section that's like, okay, check your understanding. We're going to now, you know, do some exercises where you put this concept into practice. And it's these exercises that I found most interesting because they're very uh, quantitative and they're very practical. So it's supposed to help the reader say, what, what is my goal? It's supposed to help you identify a goal and then break that goal down into smaller achievable steps and um, yeah, just create a more um, manageable kind of plan. I know sometimes when you have a really big goal, it, it can seem overwhelming. You can think, how, how could I achieve this? I think the exercises in this book are really worthwhile. They help you um, set manageable goals and help keep yourself accountable and keep yourself motivated. So I really think that uh, the exercises are the most worthwhile part of the book. So in a nutshell, that's what the book is about. I don't want to you know, give too much away. If, if you would like to purchase it, once again, I will leave links in the description section. But now I'm going to move on to talking about some of the specific topics that came up in the book. And I'm just going to elaborate on my thoughts about that. Firstly, let's talk about, in my opinion, Ollerton being an absentee father. So I'm going to read you the section of the book that leads me to believe this. But first I would go back to the UK to see my son Luke, who I had not seen for seven years. Seeing Luke was amazing, and it was almost like we'd never been apart. He was now a young 11-year-old man, and I was so proud to see him. All right, firstly, you don't start a sentence with the word but, but I will get to that in a second. I was really shocked and disappointed to read those few lines. Now, I want to obviously state that maybe I don't have the full story. Luke, so the author's son, is not mentioned very much. It's just these lines and a few more lines a little bit later on. So maybe I don't have the full backstory 
If I knew more, maybe I would have a different opinion, but um, the author chose how much to include or not include. I just have the few lines that are in the book to go on and once you publish something, once you put it in the public domain, people can then interpret it and react to it. And honestly, when I read that he left his son when his son was four years old and moved halfway across the world. So, okay, he was married. He had Luke. That relationship broke apart. Ollerton is very honest about very quickly jumping into a new relationship with a woman called Sarah, who he met at a work Christmas party. And then he moved halfway across the world to be with Sarah. And as you can see, it was not physically present uh, for seven years in his son's life. And I really was disappointed when I read that. And I really lost respect for this author because what message are you sending your son? Like, especially at such a young age where children are impressionable and their parents are, you know, their, their biggest role models, they're building their self-esteem, they're building their character. What message are you saying when you meet Sarah at the Christmas party and you say, you know what, she is worth moving halfway across the world for and I'm going to be there to spend Christmas with Sarah and, you know, do holidays with her and be there for her birthday. But my own son is not worth that. I'm not going to be there to, um, you know, be there for Christmas or be there for birthdays or, you know, um, teach my son how to ride a bike or, you know, take my son to, you know, football practice. Like what message? Are you sending that some woman you met at the Christmas party is worth more of your time and is worth making memories with over your son over spending that time with your son and making memories with your son and I don't know if he was in contact with his son during this time I hope he was I hope they you know phoned each other regularly but I just don't think it's the same thing I think when you have children and especially young children they need to be your number one priority and I think especially as a man, as a father figure, as a male role model, what message are you sending your son? Are you saying that men abandon their children? Are you saying that to be a man, you, you should prioritize some woman you met over the Chris, at the Christmas party over your children? So again, maybe I don't have the full story, but the impression that I get is that this was not a good move, that this is less than stellar parenting. And I guess it's a nice segue into um, another video that I want to make in a few days time about a channel here on YouTube which is called Dad How Do I and it's a man who gives advice that a dad would give so how to tie a tie, how to um, fix a running toilet, how to use power tools and in the comment section for these videos there are so many people who say thank you I for whatever reason did not have a dad in my life thank you very much for teaching me how to do these things because for whatever reason my dad was not there to teach me those things. And so I just think, Ollerton, why, why did you choose to chase this Sarah woman halfway across the world? Oh, and by the way, this relationship didn't work. So, you know, what a waste of time. He actually describes her house as a nest of vipers. So that's how good that relationship was. Why did you prioritize this woman and spending time with her over spending time with your son? So when I read what I read, I, I was really disappointed. I really lost respect for this man. Um, and he kind of, it's kind of funny because there's a section later on where he kind of acknowledges that he should have been a better role model. Actually, let me read it to you. If you have the privilege of being a parent, it's so important to realize the way you act around your kids, especially in their first 10 years, will forge the later mindsets that govern how they live their lives. So then why, when your son was four, did you leave him to go be halfway across the world? And then later he talks about how he was not in the right mindset to be a parent. Then like practice safe sex, practice planned parenthood, don't bring a child into this world and then like abandon them as far as I can tell for some woman you met at the Christmas party. Like for heaven's sakes, follow your own advice. Anyway, moving on. So you know how I said that you shouldn't start a sentence with the word but? Well, that brings me to the topic of grammatical errors. To further illustrate the grammatical errors in this book, let me read to you the first sentence of this book. It's a scorcher of a summer's day, and me, my brother Justin, and my mate James are wandering into town into the baths to cool down. So it isn't supposed to be me, this person and that person. It's supposed to be that person, that person, and I. That's one of the grammatical errors in this book. And you know the expression, start as you intend to go on? 
I don't think it's a good look to start with a grammatical error. And especially when this book is not self-published, there is a publisher behind it. In the acknowledgements, Ollerton says that he had an editor and a ghostwriter, so I really don't think there is an excuse for the number of grammatical errors in this book. I'm not going to go through all of them, um, I will just say the other one that was quite reoccurring was with acronyms. So if you are going to use an acronym, the correct way to go about that is first to state the whole term. So for instance, I'm going to tell you about the special air services, the SAS. And once you have first stated what that acronym is, like in full, then in brackets you write the acronym, and then for the rest of the text you can just use the acronym. Throughout this book, I have seen it done the other way around, so I've seen the acronym used first and then the full term put in brackets. That's not the correct way to go about it. I have also seen examples where just the acronym is used and there's no explanation for what that is. Now, if it's a very, very common term, if it's something like DNA or FBI, where you can be pretty certain that the you know, average civilian would know what that means, if it's a very commonly used um, acronym, that's okay. But if you're talking about, um, let's say, a particular military term or a company that operates in one country but not another, you can't assume that your international audience is going to know what those acronyms mean. So you need to state, what that full term is, and then in brackets use the acronym, and then you can just use the acronym. Again, there's the author, there's the publishing company, there's the editor, there's the ghostwriter. It looks unprofessional to have uh, all these different um, grammatical errors all throughout the book. It, and um, yeah, actually I'm going to use that as a segue into another problem that I have, which is this book sometimes contradicting itself. Still on the topic of inconsistencies and credibility, I'm going to read you two seemingly contradictory statements about goals and whether you should keep your goals to yourself or tell everyone your goals. On page 167 of the 2020 hard copy version, Ollerton states, the more people you tell your intention to, the more diluted the energy required to execute it it becomes and you've talked yourself out of it. Conversely, on page 297, Ollerton says, Now is the time for your call to action. After you've read this, please go and set yourself a goal, a challenge that scares you a little. Tell everyone about it and make yourself accountable. So which is it? Tell everyone or keep my mouth shut because the more people I tell, the more I'm sabotaging myself. Like, do you see what I mean about editing and consistency and credibility? What, what are you advising me here? What am I supposed to do? It sounds like you don't even know what you're talking about. There are also some inconsistencies when the author is talking about statistics. For instance, in one section, he states that the human body is about 65% water. And at a later part, he states that 75% of the human body is water. I've got two problems with this. So firstly, is it about 65%? Like, um, I know that could maybe be extrapolated to 75%, but like, is it about 65% or is it definitely 75%? If you have read two sources and they're saying different things, pick one and be consistent and give you know, the same statistic consistently within one publication. The other problem that I have is that in the first sentence where it says the body is about 65% certain, that's an uncertain statement. It's a roundabout figure. So it sounds as if you're not 100% you're not sure the, the data is indicating one thing, but you wouldn't bet your life on it. The second sentence is certain. The body is 75% water. So which is it? Are you sure about what you're talking about? Are you certain or are you not? Like it, it goes to your inconsistency, it goes to your credibility. Are you an authority on this topic or not? Um, and so you're talking about um, you being an authority. Let's talk about one of the texts or one of the um, authors that Ollerton references, which really seriously makes me question the credibility of this publication. Ollerton quotes the work of Masaru Emoto, who claims that water is highly susceptible to vibrations. So he claims that if you expose water to positive affirmations and then freeze it and look at it under a microscope, you will see that the frozen water will take on some beautiful shapes and create like beautiful frozen snowflake kind of shapes. 
However, if you send out negative vibrations to the water, so if you're um, saying, you know, hurtful things or, you know, um, threatening violence or that kind of stuff, and then freeze the water and look at it under a microscope, uh, it will form these really misshapen crystalline structures. I think Oliton maybe should have done a bit more research because Emoto's work has been discredited. So if you claim that something causes an effect, if you have a hypothesis, you need to have a very specific way of testing that. So you need to have a method and you need to have particular conditions. And time and time again, you need to be able to replicate the study and other people also need to replicate the study and they always need to come to the same conclusion. Emoto has been um, criticized for not sharing exactly under what circumstances he was able to produce these crystalline structures. And he was actually invited to come into a controlled environment and show how he produces these crystalline structures and was even offered a um, sort of cash prize or cash incentive to do so. And he declined to do so. And I would think if you are so certain that you can influence water by um, just saying positive things and that can influence the shape of water and you're a best-selling author making this claim, I would think you've got nothing to hide. You would have no problem doing your test in front of the scientific community and showing how this can be. Emoto chose not to do that, which really questions the authority of his... Um, of his uh, work, if you will. And so, yeah, it then, it just, it makes me question why Ollerton is so certain about what Emoto is saying. Like, how much did you research um, the validity of Emoto's claims? So it, it makes me question how um, credible some of the things that Ollerton says. Not all, I'm not saying that it's all useless. As I said, I am a fan of the uh, exercises that are included at the end of each chapter. But yeah, unfortunately, when I saw that he uh, used this particular study, shall we say, um, which could not be recreated in a um, controlled scientific environment, um, yeah, it really made me question the validity of, of what he's saying. Speaking of different sources, throughout the book, Ollerton refers to what I'm pretty sure is the law of attraction. So he talks about envisioning the life that you want and vividly envisioning the life you want. So if you want to live in a mansion, for instance, imagine in great detail what every room looks like. Imagine what the floor feels like under your feet. Um, imagine what it looks like when you, when you wake up and you look outside your window. He talks about envisioning what you want and setting very specific dates and times that you want to achieve things. And he talks about using um, positive affirmations and using them in the present tense. So not, I want to live in a mansion, but I live in a mansion. I am a millionaire. I am healthy. Um, and all of these things just made me go, okay, this is the law of attraction. It comes from the book, The Secret. Um, however, however, at the end of Battle Ready, there are a list of um, suggested books if you want to read more on these topics. And the secret is not listed. And I just thought that was interesting. Now, I, I don't know whether Ollerton has read it or not. I don't know him personally. But I just thought there's so much in this book where he does actually state the law of attraction. This is the law of attraction. And he does talk about sending messages out into the universe. And I'm like, this is overlapping so much with the secret. I just, I just found it interesting that the secret wasn't referenced when it's obvious to me that's what Ollerton is talking about. Um, whether he's read it or not, I don't know, but um, that does then lead me on to uh, kind of the topic of marketing and how you can have a good idea, but you then need to package it in a way that will sell it to your audience. With the secrets and manifesting your destiny and positive affirmations and, and that kind of thing, I understand that not everyone will believe in it. I know some people um, are quite skeptical of um, you know, spirituality or uh, the New Age movement, so to speak. And so I understand some people would perhaps not take this message seriously if it came from uh, someone like the author of The Secret. 
However, these people may hypothetically um, be more likely to trust it if it comes from someone like Oliton, who I think is a practical man, he's a man of action, he's a former soldier. So maybe there's a different audience that would say, okay, I will take this man seriously, I, I trust what he is saying. So he's saying the same message, it's about um, you know, positive affirmations, it's about you, know, you can have the life that you want, um, manifest it for yourself, you know, the, the universe will will give you what you're asking for but it's uh being said by a different person who maybe um is taken more seriously in different circles i don't know that's just my speculation let me know what you think in the comment section i think i've been pretty critical of this book so far so i thought i would at least add one good point or at least agree with one of the points in this book so Oliton regularly talks about short-term pain for long-term gain and he talks about how people become familiar or accustomed to uh, a minor inconvenience or discomfort and they would rather put up with that than put in a bit of effort and create a change even if that change would give them a long-term benefit and this is something that I agree with there have been times in my life where I've, I've put something off I put it off for so long and then finally when I'm like okay I'm gonna do this task it's like hey that that wasn't so hard like why did I put that off for so long like I could have had this benefit so much earlier so that is something that I agree with um so it was nice to see that someone else had come to the same conclusion in conclusion what do I think of this book well it has pros and cons I have highlighted some of the cons already um in terms of the autobiographical section I think maybe it could be useful um for people who have lost lost their place in the world or maybe are struggling to find meaning. Um, I think maybe even for men, I know generally speaking, men are not encouraged to uh, talk about their feelings or to appear, you know, quote unquote weak. Uh, so I think it, it might be useful to see a man talking about, hey, there was a time when I felt lost. There was a time when I didn't know what my place in the universe was. And this is what I did to turn my life around. I think that part um, could it could normalize his situation it might um create a sense that hey you know i'm not alone there's other people going through what i'm going through so that part of the book i did like i like the exercises at the end of each chapter i like that they're quite practical i think they could be quite useful but in terms of speaking as an authority and talking about your body is you know this percent water so if you uh surround yourself with you know positive affirmations it will affect the water in your body I think you need to do more research and rely on uh, credible authors and credible publications before you go speaking as an authority because when you publish something I think that's taken a little bit more seriously you're on the record and there are people who do look up to you and will um, believe what you say so I, I do think you need to you know be a bit more careful if you especially are you know a celebrity and have some following you need to be a bit more careful with what you say so that's what I have to say about that. Um, it, look, it's all right. Uh, it didn't tell me anything I didn't know. I mean, minus the, the personal autobiographical information. Um, a lot of what is mentioned in this book is the secret. A lot of it is about um, breaking down big goals into manageable goals. Not something that I haven't already heard, but um, I've, read, I've read worse books out there. <laughs> all right, so that concludes this book review. Let me know what you thought. Um, let me know what you think of this style of book review. I have done a different vlog style before. I will link to that at the end of this video. Let me know what style you prefer. Uh, let me know if you've read this book. Let me know if you think I was too harsh or not harsh enough. But anyway, that's it for today. Thank you for stopping by and maybe I will see you next time.